Romany and Buck by G. Brumwell Evans. Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 9 The Feather Seekers, January. Well, said I to John Fell, as Rack and I joined him outside his cottage. Anything fresh? The year has turned, he said thankfully. That's the best bit of news for anybody, I reckon. Just by a few moments, a little longer dusk, the door of day swinging back an inch or two wider, I said. John nodded. But there are other signs, you know, which are just as sure as the lengthening of days. I waited for him to continue. If you look carefully, you'll notice a little spirit of gallantry creeping into some of the ways of the birds. And also you'll see that already the blue feathers of the tits are looking as though they've been dry cleaned. And the cock is willing to tolerate the presence of the hen when there's food about. Isn't he always glad to see her then? I asked. Every man for himself is the law of the fields when winter's making things scarce. Consequently, if Mr. Cock finds a titbit and the little hen bird appears, then he's as savage we are as he is we a rival. But now he's willing to offer her a seat in the bus, so to speak, and thinks of taking off his hat to her instead of pecking her as she hops along. That reminds me of something I've been wanting to ask you for some time, I said. John looked at me expectantly, but said nothing. You know those long-tailed tits, I began. Those, those I pointed out to you in the pine wood yonder, asked he. I nodded and continued. Well, why have they such long tails while the little blue tits have tiny things that appear to be as much use to them as the wrens? John shook his head and said, Now you've asked me something. If I tell you that they act as balancing poles, you'll say that there's no better acrobat than the short-tailed blue uns. And what's more, they aren't such good hunters on the bark and crevices as bluey. Can't think why their tails are so long. He thought for a moment and then said, Now it's my turn to ask ye some at. Have you ever thought what she does with her tail when she's sitting on her eggs? You remember the nest I showed you? Domed one. Thick felt like moss. Feather lined and in shape like a Jenny Wren's, I answered readily. Good, said my companion approvingly. But what becomes of her long tail when she enters that little cave? You never see it become real ragged or slattern like. She might push it through the felt dome, I hazarded. And so will it out all the heat in the nest and cause a cold draught to blow on the eggs, said John, a trifle sarcastically. Nay, lad, that won't do. Just think for a minute, and you'll notice that nearly all the birds that make their nest with lids on have stumpy tails. Kingfisher, in a hole, I said. Dipper and Wren, continued John, and I nodded to show that I saw he had mentioned these birds in order to emphasise the unusualness of a bird with a long tail building an enclosed home. Well, said he, she goes in, settles on her eggs, and then curls her tail over her back and head. And you can see the tip of the tail feathers peeping through the entrance. I don't think I know a neater way of getting rid of an entrance than that. John wanted to visit some of his rabbit traps, so the dog and I took the chance of accompanying him. As we went along, the keeper said suddenly, Afore we get to the ridge cover, just try and see how many feathers you can count lying about in the fields, edge bottoms or anywhere. I looked at him curiously, to see whether he was playing a joke on me, but I saw by his expression that he was serious. I'll bet a dollar that you don't get a hundred, said he, and then relapsed into silence. Going through the first field, I felt that my task would be an easy one. I found twenty-five, most of them coming from the poultry which John kept. Then, as we left the cottage further behind, I had difficulty in finding any. Look where I would, Everything came to light except a feather. Even through one of the woods I found only two, and these had fallen from the rump of a wood pigeon. Well, said John when we reached his traps, how many? Thirty-seven, I said with a rather crestfallen air, but still curious as to John's reason for setting me the task. 
The keeper was on the point of saying something, but checked himself. Then, said he, as though speaking to himself, I wonder whether that long-tailed tit's nest is still here. I knew where he was making for. A thick bush behind his hut, where deftly woven materials of moss, lichen, cobwebs and feathers might possibly be still intact. In a few moments I heard John returning, and he handed me a portion of the long-tailed tit's former home. There's only about a quarter left, but I should like you to count the feathers while I go around to my traps. It's no place for Rack. He might get his legs in the jaws. I pulled the nest to pieces, and by the time the keeper returned, I still had not finished my counting. How many? asked John. So far, 448, I answered. That'll do then, said John. You see that in that nest there'll be about 2,000 on them when it were fresh built. He paused and waited to see whether I had now caught the drift of his remarks, and why he had asked me to see how many feathers I could find in the fields and in the woods. And I did not find fifty in the stretch of a mile and a half, I said. That's the point, said John, shaking his head appreciatively. And how do them tidy little mites find two thousand on them lying about? They may find a dead bird and use up its feathers, I hazarded. Aye, they might, answered the keeper. But they're not the only ones out looking for bedding. There's willow wrens and other tits, red starts, wrens, wagtails, linnets and sparrows. All of them use feathers and it seems to me that demand must be pretty large and the supply appears to be rather scanty. As we were returning, John said, Just think of the miles that them little tits must travel to find and then carry them 2,000 feathers back to their site. But of course they'll need them. I looked at him as he made the last remark. Why should the little tit need them more than the thrush or the blackbird? I asked myself mentally. When John noticed that I made no remark, he must have guessed what I was thinking, for he said, You see, such a tiny speck of life won't have too much heat to give away with that little body of hers, and she'll have anything from eight to a dozen eggs to cover up, sometimes more. Which would you rather sleep on, a hair mattress or a feather bed? For warmth, I said throwing to the wind all my principles of hygiene, give me the feather bed. That's why I reckon the long-tailed tit gather so many feathers. And hygiene or no hygiene, every one of them tiny specks of life seems to come out hale and hearty. As we passed through one of the woods, Rack, with evident delight, flushed a cock pheasant. Right up from a low-lying bush it went and, with whirring wings, flashed through an opening left by the tail branches of the pine trees a streak of bronze and purple shooting up into a tiny patch of blue sky. There's another fellow here along tail, commented my companion. Never examine it. I've noticed, I said, that its tail has black diagonal lines on it. That's the tally with the stems of reeds and bushes, so they can hardly be seen when standing all oil among them. But why are the feathers so long? he asked. I did not answer at once, so my friend asked another question. Which can you steer best with, a long oar or a short one? No need to answer that, I said. Well, said the keeper, why is a partridge a short, stumpy bunch of a tail? You are always asking questions, I said, turning smilingly towards him. It's the only way to learn, he remarked simply, and, answering his own queries, continued, that their pheasant lives in the woods. Sometimes, if an enemy comes along, his only way of escape lies by shooting up straight and by flying out through the tiny patch of clear space left by two or three trees. Consequently, he's got to have a good rudder trailing behind so that he can hit the space clean and true. And a partridge? he asked, looking directly at me. The partridge, I answered, is a bird of the open fields and only has straight hedges to negotiate and the whole sky is open to him. True, said John. There is a reason at the back of all nature's designs. There is no such thing as chance. After John had left us, I kept in my mind the question of how the long-tailed tit found her feathers. By the side of the wood I found the dog standing by a stone and sniffing at the remnants of some small bird. It looked as though someone had stood on the stone and then plucked the bird, dealing out the feathers as though they were a pack of cards. Rack looked up at me expectantly. Sparrowhawk, said I, 
and as we looked at all that was left of a chaffinch, I heard the tits twittering in the pines. Rack, I thought, did not like the scent which clung to the stone. A little later we watched the flashing stoop of a peregrine falcon. I am not sure what bird its victim was, but we saw it stagger and fall as the talons crashed into its back. In the quiet afternoon air we saw the feathers descending. Just a few floated down like wisps of smoke and then separated, sailing lightly down, 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 as though carrying part of the brave spirit whose body had crashed to earth. Other birds might look on with a shudder, shriek murder at the slate-blue phantom of death which had delivered the blow. But as I listened to the tits in the wood, I fancied that, looking forward to the spring, they remarked one to the other, Those hawks may eat us, but they do provide good feather beds for us. And they went on with their twittering.